Good morning, good afternoon to everyone who is connected to this webinar. My name is Juan Carlos Bello. I'm the head of the UN Environment Program Office in Colombia. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you all from wherever you are connected in the world to this webinar, which is the second of a global webinar series on the theme of environment and emergencies in the face of COVID-19 which consists of a total of six monthly webinars running from July to December this year. Uh, today is very special because we are celebrating the World Humanitarian Day. I want to thank everyone for the tremendous interest in the series. The first webinar, which was held uh, in July, uh, we had uh, almost 1,500 participants and over 3,000 people have registered so far for the series. This is a strong sign that there is an ever-growing demand to learn more about this topic, from which basically is in the nexus between environmental development and humanitarian communities. I want to mention, just for operational matters, that this webinar will be recorded. So, so I will have your implicit consent uh, to proceed with this. The recording of the webinar, as well as all materials, will be shared and will be made available to all participants after the event um, and upon completion of an evaluation survey, together with certificate of participation. So we really welcome everyone's feedback. Please make sure that you fill in the survey that you will receive by email after this webinar. I would like to start uh, by just sharing a, a few a few thoughts and and the and the main one is that of course the COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder that human health is deeply linked to the planet's health. Uh, coronaviruses are zoonotic, uh, which means that they are transmitted between animals and humans. Uh, zoonotic diseases account for 75% of all emerging infectious diseases. So if we want to prevent future outbreaks, we must address the threats to ecosystems. We, we really must uh, halt habitat loss, biodiversity loss, pollution, climate change, and of course, illegal trade of wildlife. The time for nature is now. So COVID-19 has uh, put hold in 216 countries, areas, and territories. Some of these are countries that are already in crisis due to conflicts, disasters, and climate change. So these places uh, are home to a large number of, num of people who were already in need of emergency assistance. So all emergencies, whether we are talking about pandemics or other disasters or, or complex emergencies, have an environmental dimension intrinsically linked to it. So within the UN Environment Program unit, we are extremely fortunate that we have a very strong partnership with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, through our joint environment unit, which allow us uh, to rapidly mobilize technical expertise, equipment, and remote assistance to support affected countries in responding to the environmental dimensions of emergencies. So as I, as I explained in my introduction, I'm based in Colombia. I, I was deployed to this country back in November to 2017. Uh, in response to a, a request from the government to support the environmental dimension of the peace process that was uh, unfolding at that moment. So uh, it was a great fortune for me because uh, uh, while being here, the government of Colombia faced a few emergencies uh, very linked to environmental issues and they asked for our support. So in April 2018, the Ministry of Environment of Colombia requested international assistance uh, to respond to an inland oil spill that occurred in, in an area in, in the center of the country. So in just a matter of few hours, it, it was very quick response 
we were able to organize a team of international experts and to deploy these experts uh, to here to Colombia uh, just to provide a rapid assessment, neutral, independent, uh, on basically the options for mitigation and remediation of this spill and, the, and how to address the environmental uh, impacts, uh, the basically negative environmental impacts and also social impacts. Uh, and to link this to the humanitarian response for all the communities affected. And just after that, a few weeks later, uh, that was between May and June, uh, the country faced again another emergency, this time due to the possibility of the risk of collapse of the largest dam, which is still in construction in Colombia. It's a hydroelectric dam, it's a, the Hidrituango that was basically posing a risk for a uh, half a million people uh, and it, it was it was considered as a huge catastrophe if, if it happened so we were again asked for support and through the unip ocha joint environment unit we were able to mobilize world-class expertise uh, to support the authorities in dealing with this emergency situation and and the team was uh, deployed in the country for several weeks and and we had people expert in dams uh, world experts in dams in emergencies in the environmental situation and all this team was really working very closely with the government to address uh, this problem that was uh, extremely important at the time so this type of assistance is uh, mobilized thanks to a very large network of partners such as the European Commission, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. Uh, and through them, we have been able to provide outstanding support in so many occasions. So there are th these are just a few examples out of many uh, that it is not only uh, when these sudden onset emergencies occur uh, that we can also support. Uh, recently, uh, as you know, Colombia has been at the center stage of the Venezuelan refugee and, and migrant crisis. We currently have three environmental field advisors uh, looking at the regional environmental dimensions of this emergency. Um, in th these advisors are in Colombia, in Brazil, and in Venezuela, and this work is done in partnership with the UN Refugee Agency. So as part of these efforts, uh, in November 2018, we worked with the Refugee Agency uh, on the expansion project of a reception center for Venezuelan refugees and migrants in Maicao, Colombia, which was to be uh, enlarged to cost uh, 1,400 people uh, uh, from a capacity, initial capacity of 350. So with UNHCR, we conducted a rapid environmental screening of the site and the planned expansion interventions to ensure that the environmental risks were duly considered and mitigated beforehand. So th this is yet another example of a different kind of situation that can be supported. Uh, our capacities, effectiveness, and delivery models have been challenged uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, which has posed huge constraints on access to the sites and speed of delivery, delivery of assistance. It has pushed us all to rethink how we operate uh, and how can we strengthen our remote support and place greater emphasis on the importance of decentralizing and localizing the response. Uh, and, and this leads us basically to augment any existence of national, national, and regional capacity to respond to these uh, kind of uh, situations. So we have another example, again from Colombia. Uh, this year, we have received the very first request for international assistance after the declaration of the COVID-19 as a pandemic. Um, and, and this request uh, implies us to activate the remote environmental assessment and analysis cell that probably you heard about that if, if you were in the in the previous webinar the first webinar of this series in july so the government of colombia requested uh, the support from unep uh, to 
to help understanding a sudden worsening of air quality in, in a city in the north uh, part of Colombia, which is precisely at the border with Venezuela and which has been extremely affected by the um, migratory crisis. And the problem is that there, that, that were reports that this um, air quality problem was linked to fires at open air dumps in the other side of the border in Venezuela. So thanks to the remote support partners, we were able to deliver a rapid situation analysis two weeks after activation, uh, just proving that we, we, we are able to be still neutral, deliver independent and scientifically sound services in the middle of a pandemic uh, that basically led the country to lockdown and with very strong movement restrictions for any incoming assistance. Uh, this is an example of how can how we can augment our existing national capacities and how can we leverage regional global networks and best practices from around the world. So this is because I have witnessed and I have worked, I have had this opportunity to work closely with the joint partnership with OCHA so many times that I can see all the dimensions of, of this connection between the environmental and humanitarian communities that I'm extremely pleased to and honored to moderate this webinar today. So the webinar of today will focus on environmental coordination in emergencies, uh, touching upon the challenges of doing so in the context of a pandemic with restriction in place for movements and, and the need to decentralize, localized response further. Uh, and also to strengthen country, as I already said, country and regional capacities. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely honored to have with me today to, and with us a, a wonderful a group of speakers as part of our panel. A, so I, I will go in a minute a, through the agenda. So basically here, we, you are already seeing the, the agenda. Uh, and um, I, I have with me Major General Manoj Bindal, who is the Executive Director of the National Institute of Disaster Manage, Ma Management from India. I also have with me a colleague from, from UNEP, Dan Stothart, who is the Regional Humanitarian Affairs Officer at the UNEP Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we also have Juan Pablo Ofaril Duque, uh, who is the National Disaster Response Advisor with OCHA Mexico. And we have Margarita Fanciotti, who is the focal point for response at the UNEP OCHA Joint Environment Unit. So I want uh, uh, you all to, to join me in, in welcoming our speakers. Um, in, a, in a moment, I, I will hand over uh, to Major General Manoj for the opening remarks. Uh, before we get started with the substantive contents of the agenda, I just want to mention that there will be a Q&A session at the end and we invite all participants to type any questions you may have in the question box. We will reply to as, uh, as many questions as possible directly in the question box throughout the webinar. And there will be a selection of questions that will be answered uh, live during the uh, Q&A session at the end. So with this, I, I want to, to uh, initiate uh, the webinar, handing over to Major General Manoj. Uh, Major, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you with us. Um, we invite you uh, for the opening remarks to this webinar of today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, you gave very good uh, points uh, and started the uh, whole webinar with uh, such practical experiences uh, that it has set the tone for the whole webinar. Uh, I welcome all the participants. Uh, uh, now it is close to 1,000 and increasing. So I must congratulate uh, UNEP and OSHA for uh, the popularity and credibility of the webinar which was conducted uh, in the previous month. Uh, 
because then only people join at such large numbers and they continue to keep joining. Uh, so this also uh, is on a very important topic today. Uh, today we are talking about environmental coordination in emergencies, localization and lockdown challenges. Uh, we are aware that disasters, they can impact the environment in ways which threaten human life, health, livelihoods, security. Uh, disaster managers and humanitarian workers, they must therefore identify and they must address the acute environmental risks quickly which was stressed upon by Joanne uh, Paolo where he spoke about that rapid assessment and consistently as an integral part of effective emergency response because the requirement of emergency response changes by the minute uh, and uh, being a part of the response force earlier, uh, being in the army, uh, I have seen that what the situation, what was there uh, an hour earlier suddenly changes to another and a new set of skills and resources are required. So that mental uh, adaptability has to be there among the responders, plus the resources behind them to support that. We are aware that environmental emergencies like oil spills, pollution of rivers with toxic chemicals, explosions at factories, they are, they are big media headlines and mass public protests take place. And it's good that it happens like that uh, because their effects can be devastating and long lasting and it is a responsibility of the state, nation and the world to prevent these as quickly as possible, first of all from happening and secondly is to uh, deal with them quickly when they occur. So there is a uh, uh, reason that natural disasters or man-made disasters uh, both uh, kill people, they wreck people's health, property, livelihoods, and severe long-lasting uh, impacts on the environment. So environment uh, does not come back. We are aware that a greenhouse gas, when we talk about global warming and other things, uh, even if today we stop everything, uh, every sort of emission, still it will take 70 to 80 years for the greenhouse gases which we have emitted to dissipate because a greenhouse gas lasts in the air for nearly 70 to 80 years. Uh, so, so there is a need that whatever action we do in the response and uh, mitigation part, it takes into account the environmental factors also. In many developing countries, uh, what has happened is that the industrial growth, the urbanization, that is going at such a fast pace that the government has not been able to uh, build up its capacity, commensurating to a disaster that might happen. So these uh, people living in these countries are highly vulnerable and that needs to be identified uh, so that uh, international help when required can be provided. And this is again a con continuous process when we talk about risk assessment. Uh, so risk assessment profile of the nations uh, which will require immediate help, which do not have the inbuilt capacity to uh, cope with the effects of the disaster and the uh, a suitable time frame that needs to be built and pre-positioned accordingly. Uh, we are aware that many industrial accidents, they create a lot of natural accidents also. We have seen in Fukushima where uh, a nuclear accident created an earthquake, then a tsunami, and still now people are suffering from various biological effects of that particular uh, disasters, the environment, the flora, fauna, the marine life, so much destruction has taken place. And uh, uh, so there is a need that a uh, uh, complex environmental response system needs to be put in place because the humanitarian and the environmental aspects of emergency response, they are linked together. Uh, we cannot dissociate uh, from them. Uh, it was brought out by John Paulo about the uh, uh, United Nations Center for Urgent Environment Assistance, uh, which was set up in 1992 in Geneva on an experimental basis with the support of the European Commission and Switzerland, in addition to various other countries also. In that they reviewed uh, the international response to major environmental emergencies over the pre previous 10 years. And it revealed significant gaps in the response mechanisms and identifies various ways to improve international arrangements. Uh, I'll give you a small example. Today, every uh, state is uh, wanting international uh, assistance also, but does not have various legislations put in place to receive that international aid when it comes. Because during response, during response and during a disaster, 
uh, when this uh, uh, humanitarian assistance comes there is has to be a separate set of rules for immigration for accepting the aid so a separate set of rules need to be promulgated uh, which do not follow the daily routine of uh, anything coming from outside like custom clearance and other things uh, because that prevents the uh, humanitarian aid or the response uh, whether in terms of material resources or manpower from reaching the right people in the right time so this particular legislative system needs to be put uh, in place uh, which uh, i think that this particular webinar will be talking about and uh, uh, lastly uh, since uh, we have got good speakers after me so i'll not take much time uh, we have seen that last scale uh, disasters if they were to occur uh, especially level 3 a response uh, uh, or l3 that is called uh, it will call for measures which are beyond our coping capacity we are beyond our us usual business of coping capacity and hence uh, we have to be prepared for that especially in times of and all ex resources are exhausted uh, are stretched to their limits in fighting the spread of coronavirus in fighting the infection of the coronavirus at this point of time there is a need to ensure that uh, uh, there is a balance between international national and local responders and uh, uh, the capacity needs to be built up by dialogue and by different contingency scenarios so a surge capacity is very important in environmental response international response uh, because uh, we have seen that the human resources are now strained and restricted in ways which we had not thought of in 1918 to 1920 when the spanish flu came similar things happened but that time the spread was localized because the travel was restricted this time due to travel ease of travel ease of transportation the uh, spread is increasing by a great amount and hence to draw uh, lessons from 1918 Spanish flu to the present pandemic 2020 may not be a totally a good idea because there are, uh, the circumstances have changed. Uh, so there is a requirement that we should have a surge capacity and we should have mechanism to accept that surge capacity from international agencies as and when required. Uh, so uh, a collaborative surge we talk about uh, it could enhance the mobilization among the agencies uh, which are best placed to respond a, a segment of the society which is not uh, being given its due credence is the civil society organizations mm -hmm. i've seen in many places that they are not taken on board uh, in many countries i've seen it is not taken on board and they are considered just as a a, a, a agency which will give them the resource i think that's the biggest mistake anyone can do today the civil society organizations are uh, deeply into the last mile collectivity they are the ones who have connected to the community in a big way and they're doing it on everyday basis and hence to take them on board will only uh, ensure that all the responses that we are going is done in the correct way rather than keeping them uh, sidelining them so my request to all the participants who are here is always take on board the civil society organizations the ngos the self-help groups the local community on board whenever a planning is uh, going on it should be a participatory planning uh, with all the humanitarian agencies which need to be pre prepared to step up should a major op uh, emergency occur uh, so uh, with these opening remarks i'll finish here because i'm keen to listen to all the speakers and also to answer to various questions will come up so over to you john major general Bindal, this has been extremely useful thank you so much for all your insights and very important points i i think there are uh, too many lessons uh, and considerations to take into account so thanks again and with this we we have a very rich program for today i want to invite uh, dan stothar a regional humanitarian affairs officer at the UNEP regional office for Latin American and the Caribbean, who is um, who is going to give us an overview of what environmental coordination in emergencies looks like, uh, why it is important, and which are the actors that are normally involved. Uh, Dan, welcome to this webinar.
Thank you, Juan, and thank you also, uh, Major General uh, Bindal, for those opening remarks. Um, so, firstly, trying to advance the presentation. Um, excuse me, it does not, there we go. Um, I'll start off uh, with um, talking very briefly about coordination in general. There's a lot of um, resources available out there um, about coordination and some of those training resources um, will be mentioned in links at the end um, for future follow-up. So I'll try and um, stay basically on the, the role of environment and coordination and also the particular situation that we have at the moment um, with coordination and the response and response to the environmental dimensions of emergencies during the uh, global pandemic. Um, but obviously, the main objective with coordination is to make sure that uh, both aid and aid actors arrive where they're needed um, at the time that they're needed. Um, so I found this uh, cartoon uh, a long time ago, but I think it um, shows quite clearly why we invest so much time in coordination and environment is not an exception to the rule in fact in environment precisely because it's something of a niche discipline within emergencies this is even more important in order to maximize the impact um, of uh, the role of uh, environmental expertise in um, an emergency response and this obviously is one of the consequences of not coordinating uh, or not providing sufficient resources in coordination. Um, we've all seen in different um, newspapers and um, websites over the years the various um, scandals regarding aid, some of those justified, some of those politically motivated in terms of agendas to try and cut aid spending. Um, but ultimately, waste overlap and inefficiency can't be justified on our part. And this is precisely what we're looking to avoid, including with our deployment of environmental expertise. So the explanation that coordination is about getting the right people and the right resources to the right place at the right time to do the right thing is kind of something of a standard humanitarian um, summary for what coordination is for. But this in itself doesn't um, tell us very clearly what's the role of environmental expertise in that situation. If you only have one environmental expert on a mission, how can you get the right person to the right place when there might be many places? Um, can you necessarily get the person at the right time when, um, ex when um, highly trained experts are sometimes very difficult to get released immediately from their jobs? Um, how do you determine the location of greatest need? Would that be the same location for on looking at environmental criteria as it would be looking at other humanitarian criteria? And which actions related to environment um, should we be aiming to prioritise? So in terms of looking at how environmental expertise can work within coordination, it's important to come back to the idea of um, formal and informal disaster response. Major General Bindal mentioned a lot of these organizations that you can see on the screens in the opening remarks, but all of them have a role to play in terms of, or all of them are organizations with whom environmental actors need to liaise um, when working on an emergency, whether it's government and local authorities, the international response system, the Red Cross Society in the country, affected communities, uh, neighborhood groups, NGOs, religious groups, etc. So all of these are groups um, that environmental actors will need to work with. Uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves um, to the scientific silo. And the objective of coordination, um, even and the role of environment within coordination remains the same. It remains taking the big soup of um, many different actors who are always a slightly different combination uh, in every emergency. Uh, you can see um, a general idea of um, how it might look without coordination on your screen. And the idea in uh, is therefore taking that general soup of actors and moving it to something more predictable. 
But how do we go about doing that and what's the role of environment in that um, coordination? So um, many of you who are connected, who are aware of uh, the global humanitarian architecture will be aware of the cluster approach. Uh, for those of you who've not worked um, internationally before, the cluster approach um, is up on your screens. But the idea is that there is a lead agency to coordinate um, every sector. So for example, uh, education is jointly coordinated between UNICEF and Save the Children. Food security is jointly co uh, coordinated between uh, the World Food Programme and uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. WHO coordinates global health, etc. Obviously, at the moment, WHO is particularly visible in terms of the global coordination of a health response. And the objective being that there is a more predictive response, that anyone who is arriving in the area can know who to go to, who to work with, um, and that if um, there is insufficient um, response provision within a particular sector, uh, then those cluster needs, those cluster leads can also step up to provide those needs. But if you look all the way around the circle, uh, you won't see environment anywhere. Um, it isn't even um, clearly written around the outside. Um, and that's important because, and it's important for environmental experts uh, to know that when they're deployed, um, because there are cross-cutting themes such as environment, gender, which you also can't see in that circle, uh, age and disability. They don't have a dedicated cluster um, and they are meant to be integrated into the work of all of those clusters that you can see um, on the screen. So as environmental experts, we have to learn to speak the language of those other sectors and identify how what we know about and what we can advise and what we do is of interest to food security. How can environment provide solutions to food security problems? How can environment provide solutions to health problems, et cetera? The system obviously comes with its strengths in terms of focusing uh, technical competence, organization, and defined leadership but also comes with its weaknesses in terms of potential silo mentalities. Concentrating experts can often lead to more of a niche and silo approach rather than necessarily um, a wide and comprehensive approach. And there can be difficulties coordinating between those clusters. Um, Cross-cutting themes, as I say, are not very visible. Um, and so they may fall between the gaps. And most importantly, this is a global default structure which often does not align to the structures of national emergency management organizations in um, the affected country. The role of government is also not very clearly defined. And so the entry point um, also for environment will very much vary on the situation and definitely varies based on um, the people uh, who are in charge. So in terms of bringing environment into this picture, it's important to think about who's who and who are the equivalents. So in the humanitarian um, coordination um, list of coordination actors, you would have the Civil Protection Agency or the National Emergency Management Agency um, and their environmental equivalent within the affected country would be the Ministry of Environment. Um, the local offices or civil defense branches at the local or subnational level, um, usually national emergency management organizations have local representation. However, the way environment works within uh, subnational government varies from country to country. Some local governments will have an environmental department. In other countries, you'll have an autonomous environmental corporation. That's the terminology used in Colombia, for example. Um, in some countries, you'll have departments who may work at um, the provincial level or the state level rather than at the local government level, looking at things like forestry, water resources, or urban affairs. Um, or those might also be uh, what are called in some uh, countries quasi-autonomous non-government agencies. The Red Cross is present in virtually every humanitarian context that I can imagine, but I cannot think of one environmental organization that is present in every country, everywhere in the world at national and local level. And so this can be a challenge in terms of finding that sort of default go-to ally. Then you have your UN agencies um, responsible for coordination, such as, for example, OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, 
and the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, who will establish presence on the ground if they're not present already. Um, and then the UN has its own environmental agencies, so UN Environment, um, and then also the UN Development Programme. Um, but uh, they may not necessarily always be present at the local level. Uh, the sector coordination we saw on the previous slide, but again, it's not easy to find um, an environmental equivalent for sector coordination. Then there are international humanitarian NGOs, and there are international environmental NGOs as well, and advocacy groups, although in my experience, um, the number of international environmental NGOs and advocacy groups, advocacy groups present in environmental emergency is usually far fewer than the number of international humanitarian NGOs. Certainly that's been the case in the crises that I've been deployed to. Uh, and here I'm talking about um, within the context of crisis response, not in terms of a global count. Um, and then most importantly, you have your local humanitarian or development NGOs. And here we start to get an interesting overlap with local environmental or development NGOs. Um, and then civil society and community groups who cannot be very easily pigeonholed um, into um, either of these. One of the things that I find particularly interesting about um, the response to the internal situation in Venezuela, for example, is that many of the local partners, because this is a country that is, does not have a long history of um, emergency responses and has not built up a large local humanitarian sector of its own, should we say, many of the local partners um, of uh, humanitarian agencies in the country who are responding to the situation are local development NGOs or local environmental NGOs in some cases. They're not default local humanitarian or emergency specialist agencies um, or local uh, non-governmental emergency agencies. And so this offers an interesting opportunity as well for overlap in terms of, uh, but overlap in a good way, in terms of how environmental questions can start to be addressed by the emergency response, precisely because in their normal day-to-day non-crisis um, work, those agencies, some of them, address those questions. And so in that particular emergency, that's a very good entry point for environmental coordination. Often environmental and humanitarian organizations believe their interests are very, very different, but actually this isn't really the case. Um, humanitarians or stereotypical humanitarians may believe that environment is primarily about conservation, which isn't really true. Um, and environmental organizations may believe that um, humanitarian aid is limited to provision of kits and organizing shelters, which is also not true. Um, as you saw on the sector slide, um, the international humanitarian architect, or the cluster slide, the international humanitarian architecture is more sophisticated than that. So it's important to mention where our, um, where our interests join or where our interests can, uh, can come together, because this can be a very important way by which environment can start to work within coordination together with humanitarian affairs. Environmental degradation can cause or contribute to a crisis. Underlying environmental factors can worsen existing humanitarian needs, particularly in a context of long-term or chronic emergency. Um, environment can affect long-term survival, coping, recovery, and long-term resilience. And the humanitarian response can damage the environment and cause environmental impacts if not designed carefully which would be a violation of the humanitarian do no harm principle but the response itself can also be used to improve environmental management and thereby contribute to the build back better agenda which we hear about a lot particularly um, in terms of disaster risk reduction so that's quite that's quite a lot on the what but then coming on to the how um, so I will mention very briefly some of the challenges and some of the tools that we can use while under lockdown uh, the mission that Margarita is on in Lebanon, I think, is the first international emergency deployment since the beginning of the, corona, of the um, coronavirus pandemic um, in early March. So when you think about March to August and only one international mission, considering the number of emergencies that have taken place in that time, hurricanes in the Pacific, for example, um, oil spills in uh, off the coast of Africa, that's actually a very small number of emergency deployments. 
So um, there is already the Virtual On-Site Operations Coordination Center or Virtual OSOC, which is a channel, um, uh, a single portal through which information can be channeled to facilitate coordination and the link is up on your screen. Um, and there is a space within the Virtual OSOC um, to channel um, environmental information. I believe the Remote Environmental Assessment and Analysis cell was mentioned in the previous webinar. Um, and the outputs of that cell can also be channeled through the virtual OSO. I mentioned this because it may be that in some emergencies, even if there is a deployed team, that deployed team may be very small, and that for one reason or another, it may not be possible to deploy environmental experts to embed those experts within the team on the ground. And therefore, some environmental coordination may need to happen purely remotely. Juan mentioned the example of the Columbia air pollution emergency, which was completely remote support. Um, so the virtual OSOC can link government operational responders and remote support in different locations through global online coordination. It's a good way to avoid email overload or missed messages due to not having the addresses of the key people. Um, and remote support can be channel channeled through that uh, virtual OSOC if you can't deploy. Imagine a situation where we need uh, highly skilled environmental expertise, for example, but the experts who we can access for different reasons cannot be deployed due to potential vulnerability to coronavirus and therefore we might need to work with them through a purely uh, remote um, approach. Remote support may also include analysis of satellite data adv um, or advice on sampling or analysis, technical inputs from the European Commission, the European Commission Joint Research Centre, uh, use of air quality data monitoring or anything else that's non-confidential. Um, and I believe circulating in the uh, webinar chat, um, there is a, there, or there will be a video on the virtual OSOC, which you can see on YouTube, and also a link to an e-learning on the virtual OSOC. Those links will also be on the last slide of this presentation. In order to find people, um, and this is important when you're on the ground, and possibly even more important when you're not, um, for in-person coordination or remote support, humanitarian ID is another tool which I think is very useful for environmental professionals responding to the disaster, because that helps you identify who you need to work with out of all of those um, different agencies or examples of agencies that you saw on the screen um, on the previous slide. Uh, who are the cluster coordinators in each case? and how you can work with them to better understand the responder capacity in gaps and to provide people with the right information. And if you are a deployed or a non-deployed or remote supporting um, environmental expert, the functional role of environmental expert already exists on humanitarian ID. You can use that to make sure that your environmental analysis is channeled to the right people um, and that you can identify the right place using, for example, your satellite data or your air quality data and at the right time. So humanitarian ID is one of the tools that can be used even when you're not deployed or maybe even especially when you're not deployed um, to provide that remote uh, environmental technical support um, and coordination support. So briefly to summarize, um, we need to integrate environment into the overall humanitarian operation. It won't be considered a priority if it does not appear to align to life-saving objectives, uh, to saving lives or livelihoods, um, or to be integrated into um, a sector. Environment um, as uh, something that's stuck on and separate um, is unlikely to be picked up by many people involved in the emergency. There are many actors involved in emergency response, but this also means there are many potential allies and sources to work with if you can go in with a collaborative, collaborative mindset. Look for those local partners, which ones of those have um, a development or an environmental mandate in normal times. Look at the agencies who are leading technical coordination. How can you frame your arguments and your environmental information in a way that matters to their mandate? So get involved in humanitarian coordination and contribute to the response. Don't just police the response of, don't just police the environmental footprint of the response, but actually contribute. Use your environmental analysis to contribute to saving lives and livelihoods. We all need to find a way to speak each other's language because in the end, environmental issues are humanitarian issues and humanitarian issues are environmental. 
Um, so these things are not so different. So um, you'll get this uh, presentation with the um, webinar handouts, but these are some of the further e-learning co uh, courses you can use and videos and resources about some of the things I raised in this presentation. Although there's a lot more to coordination and environment than can be packed into a 15 minute presentation, um, I hope that particularly while we are uh, facing um, mobility challenges due to the pandemic um, and deployment problems um, due to the pandemic um, that some of these ideas will be helpful if you're ever called upon um, to be an environmental expert or to work with an environmental expert in an emergency response whether it's on the ground or remotely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Dan for this wonderful presentation. I think that we all have learned a lot and and this has been excellent also to understand the challenges behind coordination and the integration of the environmental dimension within the overall humanitarian response. Uh, I think this also highlights some of the challenges that we can face in a situation like today's. And I, I believe this is the perfect bridge for our next speaker. So I would like to invite Juan Pablo Farid Duque who is the National Disaster Response Advisor, Advisor at Ocha, Mexico, uh, for, for the next presentation. Juan Pablo will talk about his experience in the Americas, uh, giving us some examples of response missions, but also covering training initiatives that are being planned to reinforce the capabilities within Mexico and regional, regionally also to respond to the environmental dimensions of emergencies. It's uh, wonderful to, to have you with us, Juan Pablo. So, so please, the floor is your, yours. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Dan. This is a rhythm. <laughs> There's a, a, a rhyme there. Margarita, hello to everyone. Thank you for allowing me to share with you some of our insights of a regional perspective on coordination, decentralization, localization uh, and in this very interesting component environmental emergencies. First, uh, greetings from Mexico. I'm in the southern border right now with Guatemala uh, uh, on holidays, but very happy being here with you. And um, greetings and congratulations to start to all humanitarians that are listening. Uh, today we are commemorating this uh, humanitarian spirit and uh, more specific and more important this year we are celebrating and, and acknowledging all the health workers uh, responding on COVID uh, uh, pandemic. I hope that you and your families are sound and well, healthy, and uh, well, we'll get started with my presentation that I'm going to divide in three parts. The first one, I will give you a little bit of a glance of the humanitarian context in Latin America, the emergencies, the disasters, environmental emergencies, uh, the operational setting and secondly i will try to share with you some experiences where we integrated this important component uh, in our responses in past international community and then finally i will just uh, finish by sharing with you some insights some food, uh, food for thought on uh, on this matter so i will just uh, change the slide let's see if uh, this works uh, Take some seconds. There you go. So there you go. So I will start uh, putting, putting you in context on, on, on Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, there's a very large region that goes from Mexico, you see that strange shape in the north, to Argentina in the south. Uh, and Latin America makes a reference to a context where it's trying to regroup different uh, countries with a, a Latin uh, language roots which that's why Brazil is in there, uh, which is Portuguese and others, and another uh, region, a very important one, the Caribbean, that we group this group of islands uh, that speaks Portuguese, uh, French, and even Dutch. So it's a very large region in terms of, uh, of, of geography. It's a very complex region in terms of culture, uh, and a beautiful region, of course. It's a, it's a bit pretty much an honor to work and live here. Uh, but uh, in, in reality, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge in terms of humanitarian mobilization uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, this in case of disasters, because 
you know, most of these countries are high middle income countries, middle income countries. This is, of course, a, a macroeconomic term, but in, in, in fact, uh, this is a, a country where we have strong institutions, strong countries, lots of capacities, of course, uh, responding uh, a lot of uh, in disasters, in terrorist management. This is a country that has uh, very, very large capacities in terms of preparedness and response, and of course, prevention, reconstruction, and all that. But as well, uh, it is one of the regions that have the higher rates of inequality. We have uh, a strong, uh, a strong economies as Mexico, Brazil, Chile, and others, where you have development indexes as uh, comparable to places in, in 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 Europe or North America or other rich countries. But as well, we have uh, great great uh, poverty, uh, misery, uh, high rates of uh, malnutrition, and this is creates, of, of course, a very very large. Uh, uh, reality and difficult to, 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 to have a grip on sometimes. So uh, very sound civil protection systems uh, and uh, civil defense in some countries. So, um, but as well, this, con this, this region is exposed uh, to natural disaster and man-made. All this experience that country has come from somewhere. And uh, of course, uh, you, can, you, can, you can acknowledge as well all the the hazards that we have, we have heard in other regions of the world uh, about big earthquakes mostly. We have uh, from Mexico to Argentina, we are in the, in the ring of fire, uh, this famous uh, 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 section of the world that uh, leaves most of the seismic activity. Uh, Mexico, Chile, Central America, Colombia, other countries are facing the challenge, including the Caribbean, of course, we remember the big earthquake in Haiti in 2010. 2010. So uh, this in terms of seismic activity, but we are still we have as well. In, we are in the part of, of the hurricane hurricane uh, path uh, with uh, 19 uh, for the North Atlantic, 19 uh, uh, meteorological uh, phenomena uh, on the Atlant on the Pacific. 15. This is an average, but most of most of these uh, 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 cyclones uh, get very strong. And, uh, and can become hurricanes. Uh, you can you have here we will have made major major concerns about the Caribbean, of course, uh, and this is a, a thing that we have to always take into account of as well. But uh, you know, uh, besides that, uh, Adan mentioned one as well: challenges in terms of in terms of uh, uh, human mobility, migration uh, is, is an issue uh, very important that uh, increase humanitarian. Uh, necessities, uh, an impact, asylum seekers, etc., uh, etc., et people for international protection, of course. And this, all this emergency over, overlaps, of course, with environmental ones. Uh, we, we, in the field, because I work for OCHA in Mexico, but are often deployed within the region, in the Caribbean, Central America, South America, to respond to, to, to these disasters, and we often uh, leave the challenges of coordination and responding in places where you have a hurricane or an earthquake and, uh, uh, and have uh, a very important uh, necessities in terms of a human, human mobility and as well uh, a, a, a environmental emergencies. All of this because, uh, as Major General Bindal mentioned, industrial growth in these countries is high and, and big. North for some of the countries around on this region, for example, Mexico and Venezuela, even though their economies are based in, 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 in oil production, gas production, there's lots of uh, minery uh, industry as, as well, electricity, manufacture, pharmaceutical. In fact, it's a region that has lots of uh, environmental hazards and often are uh, uh, presented in, in terms of emergencies. And now, unfortunately, we are now the epicenter of the global pandemic, uh, as Margarita is now responding internationally in, 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 in Lebanon. We have faced as well some emergencies, the first ones, of course, as well, uh, in, the, in the frame of this pandemic, and leaving the challenges of that, not, not in terms of international mobility, but big emergencies. We had Amanda, a tropical storm in the in the in the in, in Central America, Hurricane Hannah 
in Mexico, and uh, of course we are witnessing and supporting with information management and uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, unfolding of, of, of the events. Mm -hmm. But we are very very much seeing how what what challenges that we are facing now in terms of this operational context. Um, and uh, as Dan, as Dan mentioned, and, and Juan as well, uh, despite all these challenges and having these strong and sound institutions, sometimes not very open or reluctant to, to international assistance, we still live in a very open region uh, that uh, that is very receptive to international humanitarian cooperation. We have lots of missions, country trusts, the international community to support the responses, and uh, we have several. I will now uh, share with you some experiences uh, and just to give you a glance for example in mexico in 2010 2017 sorry we had a, a, a major earthquake that did not uh, overcome the national capacity so we were invited as international to communities to come uh, with an ondac uh, international rapid response team and uh, we contributed to uh, to the national response so uh, these countries are, are now I would say very open, very mature in terms of integrating that international response, even though their capacities are not overwhelmed. And we are sh sharing lots of experiences with them, and of course, learning from their experiences in the national in the national uh, response structures. So um, I will just share with you some some of these experiences that I have uh, I have talked to you about. I talked to you about the Mexico earthquake in 2017. Uh, uh, you see this photo of this uh, 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 blue vest that uh, is often uh, used by the United Nations Disaster Coordination Team uh, uh, that is formed and composed by not only UN agencies, but as well from NGOs, uh, partners, civil protection, civil defense colleagues. So it's an international roster that get mobilized very fast countries where they require international assistance and uh, this on that missions in life happens often and they integrate this uh, important environmental emergencies component within uh, uh, I had the honor to, to lead uh, the response in Haiti in 2016 after uh, Hurricane Matthews we have a very sound uh, team that included uh, an environmental emergencies component they were very much appreciated by national authorities in their assessment on, 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 on water pollution. Mexico's uh, uh, earthquake in 2017, but even though we didn't have an uh, environmental emergencies component, we are trained uh, by our colleagues in, in, in Geneva by the EU, and we have this knowledge as how to highlight, in fact, issues as waste management that is very important in, 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 the, in case of hurricanes and, and, and uh, and earthquakes, uh, the national authorities got the, this uh, technical advice, and we have built on on that. But the interesting case in Colombia in 2018, we have uh, two missions, in fact, back to back. One mentioned them uh, with a difference of three weeks, where there was a, a necessity to assess a, a dam that was unstable as well, uh, and an oil oil spill. So. In Bahamas, Margarita was there. She was deployed with a team. In fact, all this to say that uh, that in this region uh, we have lots of work and we are getting lots of knowledges and increasing our capacities as well, but as well learning from from the responses in in, in countries. Uh, and this said, uh, is uh, talking about capacity building. Uh, this is key. In fact, uh, in, in this region, we have lots of capacities, not only from, from, from uh, NGO partners that works a lot on this matter, but uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, official, official entities, not only civil protection and civil defenses, but as well all these ministries that works and have very, very sound experts in terms of, uh, I don't know, for example, oil industries, ele electricity, uh, transport, uh, ministries in fact we are now working a lot on uh, increasing our capacities and capacities in country that's why uh, as an example i was uh, last year in a training in slovenia uh, on emergency environmental emergencies we're going to replicate and improve that uh, that uh, training uh, for the region uh, in mexico 
uh, unfortunately now with the pandemic we had to uh, reframe uh, the calendar we are rescheduling because all this was meant to be presential now we are discussing uh, how uh, to on where uh, on, uh, and when to, to to implement this training in mexico next year uh, but all this to say we are of course inviting people not only from the UN as ONDAX and, and other agencies, but as well to partners from uh, civil defenses, countries and NGOs to participate on this. So um, this is important uh, because for this region, as I mentioned, the, all these capacities should be uh, well coordinated. We are, uh, we are aiming to create a roster, a regional roster that will be uh, used, of course, whenever required, to get mobilized people to countries and to, to work on this important component of environmental emergencies, uh, but not only to strengthen the region uh, of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, but as well to be mobilized to all the regions of the world if needed. So this is uh, our goal in terms of, uh, of training uh, and uh, the creation of a, of a roster. And uh, seeing that I have only, only uh, two minutes left, I will just finish uh, with some preliminary insights. Well, I will say it's a, it's a single idea, in fact, trying to regroup as well what, what uh, Dan has mentioned. Uh, environmental emergencies save lives. Definitely, we see that on the field. We have to integrate this important component, not only to respond, but as well to prevent human suffering. And of course, that uh, is framed as well on the other uh, components of the integral uh, risk management cycle, because building back better and rehabilitating, of course, has to have this important uh, analysis. Uh, on that missions, of course, uh, as, as a rapid responders, we have to ensure always, if needed, to have these lens, lenses uh, ready to be used in case of, 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 of uh, any disasters to complement our responses. Uh, and Dan just mentioned two very important things as well, and Margarita and Juan in, in the presentation, and even Major Vidal, how to bridge between the, the, the rapid response, the immediate actions to medium and long-term solution. This famous humanitarian nexus between the rapid response and others, this is key. I think that we are now in a new, a new, new generation, I will say, a, a new approach where we are ensuring this analysis and this uh, collaborative work with other, with other uh, actors to ensure that this bridges to, to resilience and to, to, to reduce the risk, of course, uh, that this will save more lives, in fact, <laughs> if we run and, and, and do well, the things that we do. So uh, I will end there. I hope uh, to, that uh, in these few minutes uh, I, 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 I complement the, the interesting thoughts of my colleagues. And uh, of course, uh, just a final measure saying we are all confronted of these challenges everywhere, everyone, everywhere. And let's stay safe. Let's stay. Let's stay healthy. Let's stay positive. Let's let's create new things. Let's work together. And uh, and we are going to to get out of all this uh, stronger. I hope. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, that's. Uh, the end of my presentation. So thank you very much, Juan, Margarita, and greetings to, to everyone that are listening from Mexico. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much, Juan Pablo. It has been just wonderful to, to listen to you and, and to know about all that great experience that you have in the region and all what you, you all have been doing. And, and there are also many lessons for many other parts of the world. We already had a, several questions that are related to precisely what you have been presenting. Uh, we have around 950 participants connected, so we are extremely pleased with uh, the participation of everyone uh, from basically diff many different parts of the world. So thanks again, Juan Pablo, and thanks also for, for all your good wishes and, and good energy. Um, I, I would like... Um, just moving to the next presentation, just to mention that uh, we have now an energy operation cell deployed in Beirut uh, that has been established by OCHA to coordinate international response efforts uh, towards the addressing the problems derived from the explosion that took place on 4th of August. So this uh, UNEP OCHA Joint Environment Unit is now on the ground and 
and is uh, coordinating the environment cell that has been established under the overall international response coordination structure. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely happy uh, to have with us uh, Margarita Fanciotti. Uh, I've had the, the pleasure and the honor to work with Margarita in the missions uh, that have occurred here in Colombia. Uh, and now Margarita is usually based in Geneva, but is now uh, participating in this webinar from Beirut. So, so we, I want to, to give a, a very warm welcome to Margarita, who is going to explain what interventions are going on uh, from an environmental point of view and what kind of, uh, and why coordination matters um, in this presentation. So, so what, what is going on uh, in the context of this tragic explosion? So Margarita, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Juan, and a very good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to have uh, so many of you with us today, and uh, I'm glad to see that many have returned after a very successful first webinar in July. I'm also pleased to see some newcomers, so everyone is uh, more than welcome. Today, as uh, Juan was mentioning, I'm joining you from Beirut, where um, I deployed uh, shortly after the tragic explosion that uh, happened on the 4th of August, um, which we've all seen uh, in the news. Let me see if I can uh, show my slides as well. There is uh, an ongoing investigation uh, into the causes of events, but according to government sources, uh, this has happened further to the ignition of uh, 2,750 tons of uh, ammonium nitrate. And overall, the dynamics of the event remain uncertain. But what is certain is that this environmental emergency had massive humanitarian impacts uh, in a country that was already coping with uh, multiple crises, from a deep economic crisis to the impact of the Syrian crisis and most recently the COVID pandemic. So this emergency is really adding new dimensions, a new layer to an already complex situation. And if we move to the next slide, we see that uh, unfortunately 178 people have lost their lives with more than 30 um, still missing. Um, over 6,000 people have been injured and uh, the blast has left about 300,000 people displaced. So this is another wake up call of the catastrophic consequences that uh, environmental emergencies can have and that prevention saves lives. The event has triggered a very large response from the international community in support of national efforts and many teams of international responders were dispatched to come and help. You see some of them in the pictures. Um, also the country office in Lebanon and uh, they requested the UN resident coordinator in country to mobilize the Linda team, the United Nations Disaster Assessment and uh, Coordination Team, along with other search staff. We extend our support to Lebanon and to the Lebanese people, but also to reinforce uh, UN presence in the country after many UN colleagues were also in Jordan or otherwise affected um, by the blast and by the explosion. Uh, internationally classified urban search and rescue teams have come to Beirut to support the search and rescue operations. Um, the Lebanese Red Cross, NGOs, and the various sectors uh, that were already active in Lebanon before the blast have all been uh, deeply engaged in the response since day zero. And it's great to see the world coming together to help Lebanon and its people. Today we're celebrating all humanitarians and uh, their generous efforts, but this requires coordination. And coordination is one of our uh, key functions. Um, this is why it's the same. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is also one of the key functions of uh, the INDA team that can be rapidly dispatched worldwide to support us that we can go in responding to emergencies. Uh, the explosion happened on a Tuesday, and between Wednesday and Saturday, the UNDAC team was on the ground. Uh, some of us were able to deploy very fast, arriving within the first uh, 48 hours, as is usually expected uh, of UNDAC teams, as we were on standby for other emergencies and pre tested uh, for COVID, while others arrived slightly later than usual due to the testing requirements uh, for COVID. Uh, this is actually the first deployment that we've had since COVID, so it has been an exercise uh, for all of us. And upon arrival, one of uh, the very first steps for us was to set up 
uh, coordination structure for international response in support of the national uh, coordination structure established by the government. And you see on the screen uh, what this looks like. Now, the purpose of this effort is really to ensure that all the capacities and uh, capabilities discussed internationally come together in the most effective and complementary and synchronized way to really build synergies and, and to maximize results. And the first thing we usually want to know immediately after an emergency is what the needs are, where they are, and make sure that we address them uh, accordingly. So we want to avoid if everyone works in the same area, doing the same thing twice, and uh, leaving other areas unfovered. We want to ensure that aid is delivered to those who need it and that nobody's left behind. And for this, it's crucial to have coordination. Now, when you look at the structure uh, here on the slide, you will see that we have the UN resident humanitarian coordinator on top and the highest UN authority in country, that is the humanitarian country team comprising all humanitarian agencies. And we have then established an emergency operation cell specifically to coordinate uh, international response to the blast. I am right now at the emergency operation cell, which comprises a number of uh, cells, including the environment cell that I coordinate. And it also comprises uh, key sectors involved in the response. And you see them uh, on the screen so, protection, emergency telecommunications, food security, health, logistics, shelter, uh, wash. It also includes groups of NGOs and uh, deliveries uh, right across. And if you move to the next slide, you see that the structure of the EOC, of the Emergency Operations Cell itself, very much follows international standards with the usual setup that is shown here um, on the slide, uh, covering different areas across the situation for all that relates to assessment and analysis, information management and media, operations, including environment, support and management. And you see here a few pictures of uh, what the working space looks like. And I can actually show it live to you. The video. I can actually show it live to you. We are here in this space where we have established the emergency operation cell. We have the colleagues there. And uh, basically, um, the EOC is usually a very crowded place, but uh, as we are faced with COVID, we have a mix of uh, in-person and uh, remote working arrangements uh, to minimize exposure. Um, the government has also just announced uh, the reinstatement of the lockdown starting from the 21st of August, but uh, humanitarian response will be exempt uh, and the airport will, uh, will remain uh, open. This is what it looks like, what the emergency operations cell looks like. And if you move into the next slide, I'll talk a bit about uh, uh, the environment cell. Now, the environment cell in this structure and the role of the environment cell in this structure, so my role is really to coordinate all environmental uh, CBRN and hazmat expertise uh, uh, dispatch internationally to respond to the, uh, to the explosion and to work on coordinated assessments. And the core idea is really to leverage expertise uh, deployed across teams to gather information, to cover different sectors and areas for rapid environmental assessments so that we can achieve much more together than anyone would ever be able to do on their own. And here I would like to show you just some of the key uh, information products that we have produced so far just to show uh, preliminary findings. So the first one is a map developed using one of uh, our flagship tools, the FIT, the Flash Environmental Assessment Tool, to rapidly show the extent of the potential harm to human health of uh, ammonium nitrate. Now, the chemical release usually happens very quickly, and the toxic plumes that are produced are typically dispersed within a few hours, um, but this shows the extent of that pollution, which is little up to uh, 0.2 kilometers, so the red circle that you see on the map and harmful within three kilometers, which is the yellow circle uh, on the map. So overall, 35 sectors of Beirut were exposed to the plume. And air quality indicators have since returned to um, a pre-level, to, to pre-event level um, after the sharp rise immediately after the explosion. But on the other end, uh, toxic dust can deposit on surfaces and can of course uh, be resuspended in the air with movement, including Cleanup operations, traffic, etc. 
with also the potential for runoff into the water supply system uh, in the event of rain. And if we move into the next slides, I'll show you another. Houses. We have found many of them and uh, they have been safely rescued or destroyed during ongoing operations, but we don't have uh, the full picture of what was there uh, before the events. And you see a map that we have produced to show what has been found uh, so far in collaboration with the Lebanese unit and the Ministry of Environment. Um, this is just preliminary findings. Further assessments, of course, are required to make sure that all the threats are, are identified and also to understand any actual or potential cascading risks and to restore uh, safety. If we move uh, to the next slide, we see also that the blast has generated large quantities of rubble, including glass. Basically, most of the windows across the city were blown up, as well as construction and demolition waste. And the characterization of waste and its level of hazard also linking back to the issue of asbestos is key to really ensure that hazardous waste is disposed of as such. And also that the portion that is not hazardous is reused and uh, recycled to the extent possible given the limited capacities that are available for disposal. There are two landfills uh, in the city which were already close to maximum capacity prior to the blast. So the development of a disaster waste management plan is a priority and in parallel to this uh, we're also supporting NGOs and all those that are involved in uh, clearance through training and awareness to make sure that everyone is adequately uh, protected. You see here um, some of the pictures of uh, the many volunteers including refugees uh, who are generously supporting the cleanup. So to conclude to the next slide, all in all it's only through coordination that we can meaningfully contribute to response and bringing together in different competencies, um, expertise and uh, capabilities to triangulate efforts and also really to make sure that no one uh, is left behind. And this is all from Beirut. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to drop any questions in the question box. In the meantime, back to you, Juan. Thank you very much, Margarita. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really great to have you all deployed in Beirut, supporting this, this very difficult situation. And, and of course, we, we send all, all our thoughts to all the, all the families and people affected by this blast. So we are moving now towards uh, the end of, the, of this webinar. I, I want to take this uh, moment to thank all the speakers uh, as I mentioned before, we we have uh, almost uh, 950, 930 participants from all over the world, and we have too many questions. So I I will I will do my best uh, to to organize uh, this part of the session. Now um, we unfortunately we won't have uh, enough time to answer all the questions. We will do our best to provide answers in written uh, in the in the question in the in the Q and A box. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to uh, to start. If you just give me one few seconds while while I browse this. Uh, so I, I want to start with this question um, from uh, one second, please. Perfect, from Umang Agarwal. When there is a cross-border reason for environmental emergency, like in the case of air pollution emerging from Venezuela affecting a city in Colombia, does the assessment stop at results or goes into international advocacy for mitigation? There are lots of political issues involved in this, so it's a, it's a very important question. And and I would like to pass uh, this question on to Dan. Dan, please. Thank you, Juan. Um, I did answer that question in chat, but I think it's an important question, so definitely worth highlighting here as well. Um, but the answer, to be honest, is one of those uh, depends answers. Um, uh, it's very context specific. 
it depends on the local situation and political factors, but it's very important not to let your assessment become politicized. Um, this can be a risk within a country on, a, you know, on an emergency assessment or a response that is not transnational, but it can be even more the case um, in a transnational emergency, um, as was the case between um, on the air pollution between Venezuela and Colombia. So the case there was that um, smoke uh, from fires inside Venezuela um, due to uh, the formation of the land was causing an air pollution emergency over the border in Colombia. Um, and this was just at the beginning of um, coronavirus lockdown. Obviously, air pollution adds to um, uh, vulnerability uh, to developing the worst uh, manifestations of COVID-19. Uh, so this was a particularly hot topic, um, and uh, Venezuela and Colombia at the moment have um, a rather complicated political relationship. But what the assessment actually revealed was that one of the main issues was seasonal wildfires. Um, there were dump fires, open dump fires as well. Um, but these were not as big a factor as was originally portrayed in the media. And so in that respect, what you actually had was um, an environmental assessment which was able to counter some of the uh, rather tense media narratives. But I think it's important to make sure that whatever the findings of your assessment, and your assessment may have been done in good faith, uh, that they are not used as a political football, because I don't think that leads to resolution of the problems. And that sometimes actually, when it is necessary um, to go into any kind of advocacy, lower level, much quieter diplomacy can be more effective than noisy international advocacy, which tends to consolidate quite defensive positions. Uh, in the case of the Colombia Venezuela emergency, it didn't go to any kind of um, international advocacy or anything like that and as i say one of the main causes was seasonal wildfires rather than um uh, management of uh open air dumps um i hope that helps clarify thanks so much dan it's, it's indeed a very complex issue i have a question for juan paulo uh, and and the question is what proportion of the humanitarian funding uh, uh, and that is allocated goes towards environmental issues, environmental sustainability, considering that environment is not part of a cluster. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Just a little bit of complement to, to, to the last question. In, in, in fact, uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, cross-border pollution, not only air, but as well water, uh, we count as well on bilateral arrangements. Uh, Major General is, is listening. Of, of course, countries have very, very sound uh, collaboration agreements with, with the countries uh, surrounding them. The, the case of Mexico, for example, with the United States and with Guatemala, both countries have agree agreements with Mexico to respond and assess to any kind of, uh, of uh, trans, uh, trans border uh situation in, in terms of, of pollution as well as well of course well to, to answer the question um yes of course uh, is this not part of clusters uh, uh, the, uh the environmental uh, uh uh funding uh there's not it's not part of the the, the i would say the hardcore uh, references on, on on activities to life saving uh, for example, to, to mobilize resources, we count on the assessments done by other clusters that are, of course, related to this uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of phenomena. I'm, I'm thinking on early recovery, uh, precisely. I am thinking on, on even though uh, the, the other, 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 other sectors that can be working on, on this issue, as WASH, for example, water, sanitation, hygiene, Food security as well is, in fact, environment is, is mainstream in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the in the in the in the clusters work, I would say, and uh, and it, even though if it's not a specific box where you can put chip in money, you can use that money to mitigate the, the impact through uh, life-saving responses. That's why 
the, the bridge between and the nexus between humanitarian and development is key because with that, those lenses and that approach, we can use that money for medium and long term solutions, not only to life saving, of course, which is the aim of, of this, all this mobilization of resources and the, and the architecture that I set in there. So that's, that's, uh, that's very important. I, I don't know if I, uh, I uh, answered the question. Uh, Yes, yes, I, I, I certainly think so. And we have just a very, very last few minutes of this webinar. Uh, there are so many topics, so many questions. I, I think it has raised a lot of interest and, and it's, going, it's, it's been very difficult to pick up the next question. So I, I just uh, decided just one second. Um, I, I would like to, to invite Major General to help us with this question that is coming from uh, from Ajiboy from Africa, uh, Ajiboy is asking, why is that that uh, environmental concern is not really incorporated into proper emergency response, especially when there are issues related to displacement and and, and issues involving the the civil uh, population. So he's asking that from the African context, uh, and he, uh, he or she, I'm sorry, uh, would like to, to, to have some insights on how to integrate this environmental dimension into these kind of situations and response. Major General, the floor is yours. It's a very pertinent question because environmental responses uh, is generally not uh, built into the environmental, uh, sorry, environmental response factor is not built into any international humanitarian uh, or national humanitarian response. Because at that point of time, uh, the need is to save lives, uh, rescue as many people as possible, put them in a safe place and uh, save uh, 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 as much of uh, property as possible. But there is a need, uh, what question that he has put forward, there is a need that when we are doing uh, mitigation or we are preparing for a disaster, a certain amount of the funds allocated for that needs to be dedicated for environmental protection. Similarly, during the response phase, after that, when the risk construction takes place, there should be a dedicated schemes for restoration of the environment and there should be also some dedicated uh, schemes, oblique uh, percentage of funds uh, dedicated for local environmental uh, restoration. Unless these are put into the policy and it is understood by the policy makers that restoration of environment, protection of environment, safeguarding the environment is equally important as a response, humanitarian response, and the, the adequate funds have to be allocated for that till such time this problem will keep coming up. Finally, everything comes down to uh, economy factor, uh, financial issues, and to uh, for any scheme or any interventions uh, for environmental response, environmental protection, uh, re reducing the degradation. Uh, it ha there has to be a separate mention under the budget for that. And once that is achieved, automatically things fall in place. I'll just come back to uh, also the previous question. I'll give you an example of uh, funding issues for such issues. Uh, India, uh, after this COVID-19, started a PM Cares Fund in which anyone was free to uh, donate money. And to give uh, them the incentive, a uh, uh, tax in incentive was given for this particular money. We have a, a ruling of corporate social responsibility where every profit-making organization is supposed to spend a certain percentage of their profit into disaster mitigation and preparedness and response measures. So again, in that uh, efforts have been, directions have been passed that they can use that to prepare to, uh, for mitigation of disasters from the industry point of view. So that is how we are ensuring that an enough funds are available in the, with the public to spend on such issues. So uh, finally, I'll, uh, like I said earlier, it all comes down to funds position because intent of everyone is, uh, no one wants to uh, degrade anything, no one wants to destroy anything. 
but due to paucity of resources, sometimes you have to give priority of saving of lives and property. Uh, and in that, many a times uh, the environment takes a back seat, which this webinar whole aim is to bring it to the front bench. Thank you. Thank you so much, Major General. Um, I'm very sad that we have reached the end of, of today's webinar. Uh, certainly, through throughout all the interventions and the questions and answers that, that we have uh, shared today, we can really grasp the urgency of ensuring that environmental considerations are anchored into humanitarian response. The COVID-19 pandemic is only the latest, a very powerful wake-up call about the links between environment and emergencies. We have reached the time set for this webinar, so, so I will have again to Thank everyone, uh, of course, our speakers, uh, but also every participant who has joined us. Uh, I want to invite everyone to join the next webinar uh, set for 23rd September, which will focus on the crisis waste management and remind all participants that you will receive an email with a link to a feedback survey uh, and you are very encouraged to give us feedback on this and, and of course you will receive all the presentations, all the materials and the recording from this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, have a wonderful uh, day, stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.